Hi, welcome to The Mindset. I'm Christopher Fellner, training architect with Ukeru Systems. This is episode 15 with two gentlemen from Bittersweet Farms. First off, thank you guys for taking the time to talk with us here this morning. So to start, if you would, introduce yourselves and what you do at Bittersweet Farms. Um, my name is Matt Wolfram. I am a day program leader at Bittersweet Farms um, in White House, Ohio. We work um, <clears throat> with adults with autism, but also other adults with disabilities that would benefit from our services. Um, and we are a working farmstead where we train vocational and habilitational skills here in White House. And then we also have a transitional school program in Pemberville, Ohio, and a day program in Lima, Ohio. And I'm Nick Fryman. I'm the ICF director here at Bittersweet Farms. Um, I oversee three of the homes here on the farm, um, 20 adults with autism. I oversee the homes. Uh, ICF stands for Intermediate Care Facilities. Um, so that's kind of what we what we do and um, what I do. So, so I remember to. You know, when we first started training you guys, like seeing the name Bittersweet Farms, like explain like what exactly that means. Like if if I say, oh, Bittersweet Farms is a, a place for adults, like what is it? Like explain the. So let me give you a little history and it'll mm -hmm. kind of get into where we became Bittersweet Farms and what we do. So um, Bittersweet Farms was founded by a Toledo public school teacher. Um, she had a classroom at Libby High School in 19, the early 1970s, 70, 71, um, which was the first classroom solely dedicated to individuals with autism in the US. Um, and she working with her students um, came to recognize that through trial and error that a, a good mixture of gross motor and fine motor and sensory is what the people that she served really needed. Um, and for every human being, you know, if you've got a bunch of energy to burn <clears throat> off, you want to burn off that energy before you can sit down and do math or right. learn reading, like those kinds of things. So she started implementing this with the individuals that she served. Um, and as she implemented this, um, she saw the benefits of it and how much the sensory integration and the, the integration of gross motor, heavy activity, then mixing in the fine motor. Um, so as she did this with her students, she started to look at what's available, what's out there for when my students graduate. And in the early 1970s, you had a lot of large scale institutions or people with disabilities staying at home with their parents. There wasn't a whole lot of programs out there and things available right, for right. people with disabilities. Um, so she started searching all over the country um, and she ended up finding a place in England, um, in Somerset Court, England, run by a woman named Sybil Elgar. And it was a working farmstead community for people with disabilities. So um, she went and visited that and she saw all of the things that she wanted for the people that she served as students, as adults. It was meaningful work, it was, there was gross motor, there was fine motor, but you're also mixing sensory into working on a farmstead. So hmm. she came back and she spoke with the parents and she, she began to look for where could we do this? How can we make this happen for the people here um, that we serve? And for about 10 years or so, they worked on lobbying the local governments, they worked on raising funds, gathering the community together, and eventually were ready to, to establish something. And they ended up coming to this property after visiting several um, and establishing um, a school program first. So first mm -hmm. they were busing school kids out here to the farm, but as they walked this farm and they looked at this farm, they thought about what do we want to call this? And originally um, they were coming down the driveway, which used to be a dirt drive here, and it was covered in bittersweet <laughs> vine. Mm -hmm. And they got to talking about how it represented their relationship with their children and their relationship with autism. So they felt that their relationship with autism was a very bitter one, but that their relationship with their children was a very sweet one. Um, so they thought that it very much represented their relationship um, with autism and their, their family members. So that is how mm -hmm. the name Farms came into being. So then we come to having Bittersweet Farms and, and the original idea was 
farming. So, you know, we started with gardens, with a gardening program, because when you start from seed and mixing soil, those kinds of things, you're getting all of the tactile sensory, you're getting fine motor and gross motor from seeding and mixing soil and bending and working in the field. And all of those things are meaningful in a way that I'm growing food that I can eat down the road. I'm growing mm -hmm. something that I can sell to make money um, down the road, but it also provides all of those sensory aspects um, that you're looking for without saying, hey, let's stop and do your therapy. Let's stop and, and work on your sensory things. Instead, it's just mm -hmm. incorporated in our everyday program here. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, the farm really grew. And I add in here whenever you want, Nick. Um, from there, the farm grew. So that we went from gardening to adding in the animal horse barn, you know, getting to work with animals. Obviously, cleaning stalls is a meaningful job and feeding the animals and learning to care and tend for others mm -hmm. um, by providing food and water. And um, then it grew from there. So once you have people on a farm and you're talking about having people, now we have to make sure that those people eat. And so then we have a culinary department and we work on skills that help the individuals in cooking in their own home and and also getting a job in the community. And then if you have that many people cooking and that many people working in a garden and that many people working in a barn, you need a janitorial crew to clean up behind and to make sure mm -hmm. that those bathrooms are clean. So all of these jobs have kind of naturally grown here at the farm, but what we do and intend with each of the jobs that we do here is that they have a dual purpose. So that, that dual purpose is that each thing we do not only benefits you as far as your work life and as far as growing to be independent in that way, but also in your home life and growing to be independent in your home life. So if we're working on a skill of growing your own vegetables, which at this point we now do what's called a CSA, a community supported agriculture, where we provide vegetables to the greater community around us. And we're working with the individuals on all of those skills from seeding to transplanting to harvesting, mm -hmm. Um, weeding all of those things and those skills translate into I can get a job in the community, but it also translates into I can grow my own food at home. I know how to safely take care of my own food and mm -hmm. I know how to, how to make sure I have what I need. Um, mm -hmm. The same goes for each and every job here. So if I know how to work in the janitorial crew, the janitorial crew, that's a job that's out there and available in many places, whether you're cleaning at a school, a hotel, those kinds of things as a paid job. But also mm -hmm. I know how to take care of my own home. If I know how to do the janitorial work, I know how to keep myself safe by cleaning my home and taking care of my home. Other jobs that we have here are things like art, Art is a vocational area here, but it's also a very habilitational area. So you can make mm -hmm. art to sell and you can make art to provide to the greater community around you, but also the benefits of art as far as emotionally and therapeutically for the individual. Right, expression. Yeah. Expression, exactly. There are so, and you know, there the, we talk about this in the UK room training for sure that, you know, part of the the little t traumas that you might suffer in life are a lot of times things that could have to do without being able to express yourself. If mm -hmm. I can't tell you my needs, if I can't tell you my wants, if I can't tell you my likes, then I have a hard time navigating my own environment. And I have a hard time at times because you don't understand me. And so for people who are able to express themselves through art, what a great way to open up if you can't open up verbally, if you can't open mm -hmm. up emotionally to other people, sometimes you can open up that way in your artwork. And the same thing is very true about our horse barn. So, you know, the therapy of animals, there are many human beings who may not feel very comfortable talking to a person or hanging out with a person, but mm -hmm. no matter what, your dog is glad to see you when you get home at the end of the day, right? And you can right. tell them all about your problems and they still want to be pat it on the head and they'll still, you know, give you that comfort. And that that's what our horse barn provides on top of, you know, those vocational skills and the skills of learning to care for someone else and the, the just mm -hmm. the, the humanity of that, but also just being able to express and share those emotions with animals and share their, mm -hmm. share the day with them. Well, there's, there's several things you hit on there that I was thinking about. One, I've always been curious where the name came from. You know, so that was cool getting a background there. But I was just thinking about all the different varieties of things that you all offer the folks there and how just how many people in general at large in society struggle because they don't have self-worth. 
and they don't feel like they have purpose. And it sounds like two of the key things you all instill in your folks is, hey, you're worth it and you have a purpose now. And when people feel like that, then they're more confident in expanding upon those things and, and caring about, you know, themselves, others. So that's in the art aspect, you know, I feel like that's probably one of the biggest things missing in residential systems period is the ability to express myself some way, you know, not where it's driven by this goal or this directive or, you know, whatever, but just being able to free express myself in some way that's mine. You know, Matt, I know you as a musician, myself as a musician, knowing what it did for me and growing up and like, I think that's, that's an incredible thing. Like, how many facets you all hit with people there. Um, to kind of add to what you were touching on there, Chris, like, you know, the, the, the self-worth for our individuals is very, very obvious in those things, mm -hmm. but it's also, there's, a, there's so many times where it's not obvious, but you know that you're building upon those things. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would definitely say to anyone out there, like, don't just assume because someone doesn't give you that, initial like reaction of yay i did a great job or that you're not building their self-worth because i it happens in so many things we, that we do and i think staff don't even give themselves credit or recognize it a lot of times that as long as you're giving that person that opportunity to do those things and you're allowing them to be themselves and express themselves it, mm -hmm. it truly benefits them yeah right. nick what are some of the the key strengths that you see like as far as the programming that gets provided there bittersweet I think we run on a um, a mass philosophy, uh, meaning motivation, aerobic activity, uh, partnership, um, and structure and support. You know, we've we've ran on it's called maps, and we've ran on that for years and years, and we try to um, integrate that into our orientation um, when new staff start. Um, just explain the meanings behind all of those. Um, letters and what they mean and what mm -hmm. we look for. Um, you know, we we try not to do things for the individuals. We try to be there for and support them and um, have structure for them where they can try to be doing in, things independently, but we're always there mm -hmm. to assist. But I kind of wanted to touch on Matt and uh, what go off of what Matt said in regards to Bittersweet. We also have a transition program um, mm -hmm. for school age kids, 12 to 22. Mm -hmm. In our Pemberville location, uh, Matt and I, I've been with Bittersweet. This is my 17th year. Matt's been here for 25 years. Um, we've each had our hands into the school program at one point in time. Um, but basically, we we get those kids, we get those public schools reach to reach out to us um, for kids who you can't sit in a you know a normal classroom. So our transition schools gives those opportunities to have free range. It's not a, your normal classroom. Um, they can get up, walk around. We have land out there as well. Um, they can move around freely. Uh, we do have, you know, different activities and, you know, lessons that we do. However, we do have a greenhouse out there. So we, we start them out there. And a lot of those students transition into our day program. Once they hit 22, they receive a diploma through their public school as well as through Bittersweet Farms. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have some of those individuals who reside out here in Bitter at Bittersweet now in White House. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've graduated yeah. many students and we're they've come a long way. So it's well, I like the fact that you you're talking to a focus on. The goal isn't for you to stay here forever, right? The goal is to try to empower you to basically be out on your own, do your do your own thing, whatever that looks like. And I, I like and appreciate that, that aspect of it. Absolutely. And the, to kind of piggyback off of that, the goal of the transitional program, you know, for, for so many of us, not just people with disabilities, mm -hmm. um, routine is something that is something that we become very comfortable with and something that we want to be part of mm -hmm. um and 
for the individuals, the goal is that the last day of school should really look like the first day of work. So the transition, when we say transitional program, the transition is that that growth from school to work. So if you think about the typical transition of your quote unquote normal person, you graduate from high school and it's go find a job or go to college like the, mm-hmm. that. That's your transition. Yeah. And it's that's a very hard change. That's a very hard change for many People who go to college, most most if not a lot of them drop out in the first year. And mm-hmm. a lot of people don't stick with the job that you find when you're 18 because you're still growing and you're learning and you know right. you're you're figuring out who you are. And our goal is to make that transition or that change as easy as possible for the people that we serve. So, you know, you don't go from this drastic change of I'm in a classroom sitting at a desk learning all day long to all of a sudden I'm expected to be working and have stamina and be be having this time on task and being able to follow these protocols of whatever job I'm in. Mm -hmm. The goal is to really help those individuals that, you know, on day one in our transitional program, it should mostly look like school, but on the last day, it should mostly look like work. And then we're able to gradually provide that transition without it being such a shock to the system. And, Mm. you know, for many of those individuals, it then helps them to be able to find that job out in the community, be able to transition to that job in the community. And yes, here at Bittersweet, we do have residential. So it's not just, we don't just have day programs, we have residential settings, but the goal is always independence for our guys. Mm -hmm. The goal is always, how can we help this person to be as independent as possible? How can we help them to grow within their life? Um, you know, when when we talk about our residential settings here, our residential settings are based on all of those same philosophies that everything we do has meaning and motivation behind it. None of us would want to do something without meaning and motivation. You wouldn't go out and dig a 10 foot by 10 foot hole if I told you to do it, if I gave you no reasoning. If I gave you a reason, hey, we're going to end up turning that into a pool and we're going to this is what we're going to do with it. That meaning behind it helps to motivate you to do it. Mm-hmm. The aerobic activity part, you know, that that harkens back to the origins of Bittersweet and that we want gross motor activity in what we do. We want to be able, well, at the end of the day, and this, you, maybe this is an old fashioned mindset, but I, I believe in this. And I think most of us here believe in this is that at the end of the day, you should be exhausted. You should be worn out from working hard all day, like whether it's mentally stimulating yourself or physically stimulating yourself. Every day should be a full day. We should be going out and enjoying a full day. And if if we're not exhausted, then we're not putting everything we can into making sure that the people that we serve are having a wonderful day and that they're exhausted at the end of the day, that they've had a full, wonderful life and they've had a full, wonderful day, regardless of whether we're going out to have fun, which we do on evenings and weekends a lot of time. Even on our day program, we're going out and volunteering and going and doing different things, different places. But we're going to a baseball game or going, you know, going to the parks or whatever. It's Mm -hmm. about sharing those experiences and really having a wonderful full day with everyone here. So, you know, that aerobic activity is a huge part of that. And then, you know, partnership. We all want people to share our lives with. We all want people Mm -hmm. around us. There are some people who are really loners and would rather be all by themselves. But Mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, and Ukeru kind of opens up with this. We all want to do well. We all inherently want to do well. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the truth for everyone here. And we all want to have full lives. No one wants to sit and do nothing all day long. That's not a full life. That's not getting to engage the people around you. So we make sure that we're doing that and we're including the individuals and everything possible. And we're also doing what we call reverse inclusion, um, which is making sure that we're always inviting the community here. You know, it's not always just we have to go to the community. It's let's have the community here. Let's bring the community in. Um, one of the great things that we get to do right now, and I, you were talking about this with the music. I don't I don't technically consider myself a musician, but I love music. And um, uh, we have what we call our music vine every Friday. And local musicians donate their time. And we have a concert every Friday for the individuals here. So, you know, we have a, a hard work mm-hmm. week and we work hard all week long, but we play hard, too. And. You know, what great therapy to get out a bunch of drums and cymbals and different things and tambourines and start playing with local musicians. And it creates such a bond with the local community because mm-hmm. the musicians know everyone that comes. We invite all other providers. It's open to the community. So we have just members of the local community come to the concerts. But 
it also provides that sense of community and getting to meet other people who are out there doing things in the community and coming to join us. So, um, you know, all of those things come into play when we're talking about how to support the people that we serve here. And the number one part of our MAPS philosophy is support and structure. So it all has to be structured. So for the people that we serve here, we make sure that we're providing schedules, that we're providing structure and routine and can make things as predictable as possible for them so that they know what to expect next. You know, if, if you're going into a job in the morning and you have no idea what's expected of you, then you don't know what to do. Right. So for, for the individuals that we serve, we make sure that there is a routine, there's an expectation, there are patterns set so that they're learning those on the job skills. So that they're learning just the ways to navigate life. We all have those routines we work through and our goal is to help the individuals with those routines. And, you know, one of the challenges, and again, you know, kind of hearkening back to the, the material that um, Ukeru provides, um, many of the, the individuals that we serve have had so many staff come through their lives. Right. You know, staff turnover is a huge thing for mm -hmm. people in our field. It doesn't matter whether you're talking mental health, whether you're talking disabilities, staff turnover is a huge thing. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I see that as a huge, as a huge trauma to the people that we serve because they build trustful relationships with people that they come to know and love. And then those people are gone from their life. Right. And, and so, you know, the longevity, the staff that have longevity <laughs> have, have great rapport and relationships with those guys. But I would say that one of the key things to make sure that every program is doing is that you're providing that structure and routine that your staff are being trained in a way that they're providing that for the people moving on. Because if you make it totally reliant on a staff and that staff leaves, now this individual has no way to continue to move forward and or is going to go through a very difficult time because we're not carrying on their routine. So that's a big part is that support and structure for the individuals mm -hmm. and making sure that that carries on regardless of who's there. Now, I understand losing losing a staff, losing people is very hard on the individuals. And I, mm -hmm. I very much believe that that is one of the biggest traumas that the, we, the people we serve suffer is, is losing staff over and over again. Oh, absolutely. And you can think about how many of those people have been in their intimate zone and, you know, how many people have been in your intimate zone in your life, you know? Absolutely. They are times three that, you know, it's, it's just crazy to think about, but yeah. And I, I'd say one thing that, you know, bittersweet prides itself on is that structure and support, you know, schedules, schedules, schedules and routines, um, you know, whether it's day program, whether it's residential settings, there's always a schedule in place, um, whether it's in the home or for the individual specifically. Um, I think we do a great job of that here at Bittersweet and, you know, getting the individuals exactly what they need. So, you know, and thinking about the, the staffing challenges in general are all around, really all around the world in this field. You know, Nick, you said you, you've been in Bittersweet 17 years. Is that right? 17th and Matt 25 what brought you to to this field and what has kept you to in it for so long yeah I can I can go first um sure mine's a little long um so it's gonna sound a little crazy I do have a second cousin who lives in Texas who has Down syndrome um he's always been his name's Skeeter he's always been a um somebody who I look up to um somebody who I look forward to seeing mm -hmm. when I do see him. Um, but in seventh grade, uh, we took a field trip out to Wood Lane, which is um, Wood Lane School, which is a school for disabilities in Wood County in Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. um, and it was their field day. And I just had the best day ever, just doing all kinds of games, outdoor activities with all these individuals. And I said, since seventh grade, I knew what I wanted to do. So I went to BGSU for special education, mm -hmm. uh, did all, a lot of school work through Wood Lane. Um, I was looking for a summer job. I had some other jobs at different places. I worked out at a camp called Camp Krem mm -hmm. in uh, Boulder Creek, California, in the mountains of California for a summer. Uh, it was the best experience of my life. Uh, you're in the mountains and then 10 miles down the mountain, you're at the Santa Cruz boardwalk at the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
and we did many things with many individuals. Um, it was literally the best experience of my life. But uh, in regards to bittersweet, uh, I was just looking for a summer job. I applied um, for the summer program for adolescents. And ever since then, I haven't, I've, I've loved bittersweet. I came from the summer program into the ICF, um, was kind of thrown into leadership position um, and kind of overseeing the ICF at that point and um, learned a lot very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I failed many times, <laughs> um, but it got me to where I am today. Um, I also spent six years at the transition school um, where I worked with those adolescents. And then when COVID hit, uh, our school shut down mm -hmm. and uh, I moved back into the ICF as the manager position. And then once the director position came open, I applied for that. Um, so I've been in these guys life for 17 years in the icf um as well as many of the day program participants um so that's kind of what brought me to bittersweet i call this place home my second home and my second family because they are like family the staff mm -hmm. included staff and residents it really is a and i'm sure matt can attest to this it's really it's really been home and a family here so that's Kind of where Absolutely. I'm yeah. Cool. What about you, Matt? Yeah. So what brought me to Bittersweet, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of was uh, that person I was talking about a little bit ago at 18. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. Obviously, Nick had it figured out a little sooner. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to work with people. That's why he's a director, um, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. I knew I wanted to work with people. So, you know, at 18, I, I went to college and I started out um, working on a psych degree. And uh, like a lot of people, uh, the first year of college, I dropped out, um, thought I knew what I wanted in life and moved to Florida. Um, so I was down there for a little while. Um, didn't really necessarily like it. So I moved back up here to Ohio mm -hmm. and uh, started working at a wood shop just because it was a job that was available. And while I was working there, um, I was babysitting and speaking to a friend who was like, hey, I work at Bittersweet Farms and I feel like it would be a perfect fit for you. And so he had kind of told me all about Bittersweet, told me that it was, you know, a wonderful place to come and work because you have this 80 acre farm where no two days are ever the same. You get to spend time with wonderful people. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had kind of talked it through and then it just so happened that the next day I was at a separate friend's house whose mom ended up being our executive director, a former executive director here at Bittersweet. Mm -hmm. um, and she kind of threw out the same thing. She said, you know, I think you would be a perfect fit at Bittersweet. You should come out and apply. So I, I came out, I checked out Bittersweet. I applied. Um, they actually offered me a job that day and I started the next day. Um, just started working in our gardens program here. Um, you know, didn't know a whole lot about autism, didn't know a whole lot about disabilities, but the staff and the individuals were very much on board to help me learn and grow and you know it it really taught me a lot um those people kind of taking me under their wing and teaching me but kind of what's kept me here at bittersweet there's there's a number of things that have kept me here at bittersweet so first and foremost no two days are ever the same and that mm -hmm. is i love coming at a day of i know i'm working with people with autism today but i don't know exactly what my day is going to hold because <laughs> human beings could need one-to-one -one support one day and they could need one to 25 support the next day because we're all emotional beings and we all grow and change and you know things affect us differently on different days you might wake up in a good mood or a bad mood so no two days are ever the same and bittersweet has also provided me the opportunity to move up and to grow in my positions here um kind of funny you said, you know, that's why Nick's a director. Well, so at, at one point I had I had moved up the chain a little bit and I had moved up to to being a staffing manager and being a, a program coordinator. Mm -hmm. And for me, 
I wasn't getting enough direct support interaction at those times. I thrive on getting to work with human beings, getting to be with human beings and getting to be part of their day every day. And for me, it was too much time in my office at those times. So being a program leader allows me the opportunity. Basically, my job right now is as a float around the farm. So I fill in where the need is. So if we're short staffed, I'm filling in wherever that need is. But also my job is I train new hire staff. I teach them Ukeru. I train them and mentor them in working with the individuals that we serve so that that structure can maintain in place so that I can be teaching Mm -hmm. them what we've been doing for 25 years. Um, But also I, you know, I spend my days kind of helping people to navigate difficult situations and coming in and helping like you know i will discuss in our debrief sessions like kind of who's having a difficult time what days are they having a difficult time and i'll kind of make sure that i'm putting myself in and around those situations to help give advice to help support those individuals and to help them to be able to have those wonderful times that we want them to be able to have because people definitely do struggle for sure Mm -hmm. um bittersweet has allowed me the opportunity to have ideas and to have those ideas grow. So that music buying that I was talking about, the concerts we do on Friday, that was just a dream that, you know, it was, it was something that six years ago, another day program leader and I discussed and said, wouldn't it be great to provide something fun at the end of the week for everyone to look forward to and to work toward. And let's just have a musician come out and play one time. And the musician Mm -hmm. did. And so many of our individuals, first of all, there were smiles on faces that you don't see smiles on a whole lot Mm -hmm. of the time. There's people getting up and dancing and interacting. There's people playing instruments. Um, You know, we have one one gentleman who will dress up like Elvis when we do our music buying and he brings his guitar and plays along with the musicians. And so it's very interactive. But the one of the coolest things about Bittersweet is if you have a dream like that and you have something that you think would be very beneficial for the people that we serve, if you're willing to be the driving force behind it and you're willing to put in the legwork to make it happen, Bittersweet's willing to support you in making it happen. And that Mm -hmm. you don't get that from every company. Bittersweet is very much about if it's beneficial to our guys and you can make it happen, make it happen. So that, that Mm -hmm. is definitely something that has kept me here. Um, Ukeru is so and Nick and I, and this isn't something that we've even really touched on yet. Um, so him and I have been training physical interventions and and or um, proactive interventions together for 15 years now, Nick. Yeah. Um, and I think it's three or four systems we've been through now. Um, and, you know, one of one of my most prideful things about Bittersweet that I've been able to help provide is that when I first came to Bittersweet um, mm-hmm. and in my first several years here, we were still a facility that utilized restraint. There was still restraint in our facility at that time. And um, in 2005, myself um, and other staff um, and some of our our director team um, helped to usher in the restraint-free movement here to Bittersweet and to move away from any restraint for anyone here. Um, You know, we've been through a couple of systems that are restraint-free systems and different different types of training. Um, but about eight years ago, we came to find Ukeru um, and, and it provides a level uh, above and beyond of what some of those other systems did in that, you know, the blocking pads and those kinds of things provide an extra level of safety to work through for our staff, to help them to feel safe and to help the individuals to feel safe. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's key, you know, for our staff to be able to support individuals who might have some aggressive um, incidents or may have self injurious incidents that can put you on edge and it can make you very nervous. And that can be hard to support somebody if you're already not feeling safe. So Mm -hmm. for for them, providing UK room, providing the blocking pads, providing that training really helps to provide that comfort factor. And once you feel safe, you know, Maslow's hierarchy and, you know, safety needs are right down there with food, water, warmth and rest. You have to get past those safety needs to be able to support people, to be able to build relationships. And and that's that's where I I feel like one of the things that has truly kept me here is being able to teach people about that, being able to show people that, you know, it's about building relationships. And and no, no matter what the situation is, you know, like if you are if you meet somebody out in public, 
there is a whole system to building a relationship with that person of asking questions, getting to know them, finding common ground, all of those things. And that's what we want our staff to be able to do, but they first have to get past all of the other barriers. So, you know, not only are we trying to help people to learn to socialize, because that isn't always easy mm-hmm. for every human being. We don't all make friends easily. And so Especially these to, days. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then getting trying to socialize and become friends with a person with disabilities where their communication might be different, their understanding mm-hmm. might be different, they might have trauma. You know, all of those things can become a factor. So mm-hmm. first and foremost, you have to make sure your staff are ready to receive and accept that incoming information and ready to provide information to the individuals and that comes with safety and i feel that that's a huge part of what has kept me here is that i love teaching people those things and teaching people how to feel comfortable while supporting people because it isn't necessarily something they've done before when they're walking in the door or they may have done it before in a different facility and been taught in different ways taught in controlling ways taught in ways that we're not definitely we definitely don't aspire to here at Bittersweet. So it's changing that mindset and really helping them to focus on proactive, positive supports for the people that we serve. That's what I was going to say. Also teaching, you know, proactive strategies rather than reactive. You know, when I first started here, I'd say I was more reactive than proactive. So, you know, Mm -hmm. learning that and being able to teach that to, you know, newer staff, you know, college students, you know, students coming right out of high school, it's, they're not used to that and you know teaching them those strategies i think you know it's 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 good to see through our teaching for sure you you see that Mm -hmm. down the road as they pick it up so yeah thinking about how long you guys have been certified as trainers in akaru you know i was talking to i was actually just talking to my fiance about this um about that training in, in Maumee that you all were at. I was like, yeah, these guys from Bittersweet Farms. I was like, I've only missed one year out of like eight or whatever it's been. You know, I've always been the guy that's trained them. And I said at this point, like there's, there's certain trainers like at different locations that I've trained so long that it's almost like a, it's almost like a family reunion or like you get to see old friends. I was like, I was like the Bittersweet guys, it would be, It'd be sad if I didn't see them when I went. Like it would feel very weird, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, like I said, getting to be you do such a wonderful job training it and, and teaching us how to train people. That you know, I, I, honestly, you know, I make. Each of us makes Ukeru our own as we're teaching it yeah, because you add yeah. stories and you do those kinds of things. But having having the training that you do really provides such a great groundwork for it. And it, and it really is. It is like seeing an old friend and, you know, we're going back to have that family reunion and maybe talk about a little graffiti and some bathrooms. And, yeah. and uh, <laughs> All right. I remember the, our first training. I think I was nervous as hell. So, but we got through it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. You know, you never really know what to expect when you train in a different approach, you know, because like for me, you know, working in different places, you know, I've been through three or four different crisis intervention systems and things of that nature. And you never know what the restraints are going to be like or what the releases and philosophy and stuff. And I think that people when they and maybe you all can speak to this, I feel like when people first come to get who carry training, they think it's going to be more aggressive than it is. Like we've got these pads, so we're going to jam them up like you see on TV or something. And I think when they see that it's not that, plus all the philosophy backs it, I think it helps put people at ease once they actually go through it. Which I think Matt and I have learned over the years as well. You know, Matt and I used to go pretty hard in our trainings. Um, where I think nowadays, you know, we're more focused on, you know, making sure they they get the material, making sure they understand and can utilize the material Mm -hmm. um, rather than just going full blow and, you know, them being scared to even training. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But, yeah. And the fact that we're older and out of shape, but, you know. (laughs) 
Yeah, none of our clocks run backwards, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I do think that a lot of times staff, and I, you know, when we have new hires come in, when we first get out the pads, you'll hear them kind of like, oh, oh, I, you know, thinking about aggression and thinking about, you know, how aggressive it's going to be, those kinds of things, you know, practicing mm-hmm. with the pads and getting ready. But I think that as far as, you know, understanding goes, as long as you're teaching them the right way and that their understanding is that, you know, Ukeru is about accepting or receiving. So, you know, it's all defensive mm-hmm. and you're really helping somebody to work through something. And, and I think that people who have maybe been in the field, have maybe worked with kids in schools, have had um, different programs that they're taught that are a little bit more aggressive. Um, you know, there are definitely school, schools still utilize restraint a lot of the time and utilize some of those things that, um, you know, have kind of been phased out in a lot of places. And so I think that those people, the people who are used to using a system that was maybe a, what I would consider a more aggressive or intensive system without um, without that true understanding when they come in and see the pads in Ukeru, I think they first think that it's more aggressive because you're using mm-hmm. blocking pads and not just stopping somebody from doing it. Right, um, right. Where I, it really is far less aggressive because I'm not putting my hands on you and I'm allowing you to work through this and we get through it versus it becoming a, a battle. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is, that is a huge mindset shift for many people. And, you know, I would say, you know, I think Ukeru, you guys kind of started this 2004, right? Is that? That's when it, the uh, initiative was really like rampant. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, like I said, 2005 is when we started going restraint free and stuff. So, you know, people who've been in the field for years and years Mm -hmm. have that mindset. And I think that when you start talking about some of the school systems, you know, we talk about, I talked about routine and that structure carrying forward. I think Mm -hmm. that school systems, at least to a point have been slow in progressing and, in moving past those things. And also there's, you know, there's a level of understanding that, you know, like we were talking about with the transitional program, you know, we want we want people to be integrated as much as possible right and we want people to be in a setting quote unquote typical setting as much as possible but i would argue that a lot of the students that get in trouble in school your quote unquote typical students need that gross motor too just like the people with disabilities who may be getting restrained in a classroom because you're trying to make mm-hmm. me sit still for eight hours <laughs> and right. that's no one wants to sit still. I can't sit still for eight hours. I, no, me that's neither. Of, right. <laughs> and that's part of why I love bittersweet is because I can try. We've got 80 acres here. We've got hiking trails. We've got fire pits. We've got stuff happening all over the place. So you can always go and interact and engage. And and I think that that is, is something to be said for, you know, some of the people that we serve. I'm sure you see this people coming out of schools, people coming into mm-hmm. systems where they've been restrained, they've been chemically restrained, those kinds mm-hmm. of things in a school setting because we need them to sit in a classroom and do nothing or, you know, quote unquote, nothing. You know, we need them to sit and pay attention to paperwork. And that's not what that person needs right then. And it's really right. about meeting people with what their needs are. And then you can avoid those aggressive incidents where staff are, I, I feel that in most restraint staff are being way too aggressive because you can work through with that person. If you would have been proactive, you would have been able to avoid that in the first place. Mm-hmm. And when someone does explode with Ukeru, you can use the blocking pads. You can give them that space. You can work through it with them and figure out what went mm-hmm. wrong versus I'm just going to control you and keep you here in this spot. Right. Well, it's, you know, having come from a background where, Unfortunately, I had to do a lot of restraints in the past. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges with it is it's it's more than just the technique of it. You know, it's the temperament of the person doing it. It's the, you know, how how well you can keep yourself 
even though it's not a relaxing situation, keep your body relaxed when you're doing this technique and your thought process and all the stuff we talk about with the brain, you know, and I don't know. It's, it's, I really feel like it's a, it's a crapshoot anytime a physically invasive technique is used because you're really at the mercy of the person doing it, you know, and how well they can control themselves one way or another. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, let alone, you know, more, um, you know, injuries to yourself or that person. So yeah, for sure. So let me ask you guys some things, you know, y'all have been with us for a long time training. Um, there's some things that questions that come up here and there, and I'm curious how you all would answer if someone asked you. So let's say like I'm someone that's never been through Karoo, but I've heard about it. I've heard that you guys use it and we're hanging out. And I was like, well, you know, we thought about using a Karoo, but you know, we could just buy some pads off Amazon and just block. Like, why do we need Ukeru? How would you answer that? So I, I would probably start with, um, trauma informed care. And, um, I want to say probably early 2010s, 2011 is the first time, like for me personally, that, trauma informed care became a major part of what we were doing here. Like it, mm -hmm. it kind of, people started really kind of paying attention to it and, and trauma informed care not only provides um, an understanding for those staff, but it also provides a basis of, I know that this person is going through something. And, and mm -hmm. I think that there's so many times that if you're just reactive in the moment, then you're only reacting to what you can see. You're reacting to, you know, your own history, your own, mm -hmm. you know, as we were just talking about, you know, a staff would do, uh, if a staff is utilizing a physical technique where they're fully physically involved, then mm -hmm. it, it kind of a crapshoot as far as what that person is. And that all goes into like trauma. If the, if the staff has suffered trauma, if, you mm -hmm. know, how they've been treated growing up, those kinds of things. So, trauma-informed care really helps staff to take a step back. And, they, and you can see this when you're teaching Ukeru. It mm -hmm. forces them to take a step back and really look at the person as a person. And mm -hmm. that needs to happen way before you ever think about intervention strategies. So right. proactive strategies, supportive strategies are the key to Ukeru. Those, those intervention strategies Yes, they're important. They're important to know that they are a major part of when the shit hits the fan. But the goal is proactive prevention. And that mm -hmm. proactive prevention is where humanity comes in. It comes in, I, I'm getting to know this person. I'm getting to know what they need. I'm getting to know what their background is. Who are you and what do you need? And how can I provide those things? And then where are your struggles? And when you have those struggles, what things can I be working on with you to learn how to deal with those struggles? Because, you know, the time, the time to teach is not the boiling point, right? Like the time to <laughs> teach is when someone's in a good place. Mm -hmm. And, and so for our staff, first and foremost, they need to understand when to teach, how to teach, how to work with a human being way before you start talking about blocking techniques, blocking techniques come into play when all else has right. failed. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Nick. Well, no, and I was just going to say they, you know, we have individuals in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and that trauma informed approach, you know, helps you understand, you know, me in my early 20s and whatnot, I would have never thought of that. Like, what has this person been through? It helps, you know, staff mm -hmm. realize like these individuals have been through some stuff, like have some empathy, and, you know, it's all about, you know, to teach them understanding that, you know, I think that everybody sees Ukero and they're like, oh, it's blocking pads. You know, there's a lot more to Ukero <laughs> than just right, blocking right. pads. You know, the whole teaching section is mm -hmm. huge when it comes to Ukero. You know, it helps, you know, and even when I went through Ukero, I was still like, wow, like never, never thought of that. You know, mm -hmm. I think it gives a lot of newer staff, you know, that you know, reassurance that they can, there's more to it than just blocking pads. So mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I, what what I think it does is it provides thinking and talking points for those staff um, when when you're going through those things. And I, you know, you don't always think about all of those little T traumas, but when, when you have those lists in the UKRU training, I stop at each one and talk about like, okay, so let's talk about inability to communicate. How does everybody mm -hmm. feel about the inability to communicate? Imagine going through the next week and not being able to tell anybody anything, no mm -hmm. expressive communication. And it, it gives an opportunity to really put the staff into the individual's shoes, but it also gives an opportunity. And I, I think that this is um, really beneficial when you have like for, for Nick and I, I think that it, it really helps is that Ukeru allows the opportunity for us to kind of train from our experiences and to, to talk about our experiences with the specific people that we serve here and and our growth so you know there are things that i didn't understand coming into this field didn't understand for the first number of years in this field that i understand more fully now and i feel understanding those things i can pass that knowledge on to people through keru so mm -hmm. you know when you start talking about some of the traumas that people may have have suffered you know for me when i first came into the field like thinking about any kind of parental abuse or or those kinds of things got me really angry and upset and and you know then you start to work in the field for a while and you find out that you know there's some some co-trauma there when you're talking about some parents and serving people with disabilities mm -hmm. and their children and that you know they it, it could be that you know a parent it, they have a child who doesn't sleep at night and but they still have to work and then they're f figuring out how to navigate how do i positively support my child but still get sleep and sometimes those end uh -huh. up in negative circumstances and they end up in what it, end up being abuse type circumstances but truly the parent is in a survival mode at that time and I would tell you that I didn't have an understanding for that coming into the field. I didn't have a, a compassion or an understanding for the family and the parents of what their life has been and what they've gone through, possibly supporting this person or having to have their child move out of the house at a young age or yeah. having aggression towards siblings or themselves. And those are things that staff need to understand and they need to have that communicated to them in an understanding and caring way so that they have that empathy for the individuals empathy is a huge thing and and mm -hmm. i feel like just saying that oh we could just get blocking pads misses the whole point of <laughs> accepting and receiving a person we're not right. accepting and receiving just aggression we're accepting and receiving a person for who they are and for all of the things that go into making them who they are yeah well gentlemen i appreciate you all taking the time with me here this morning you know we trained we just trained what was it last month towards the end of last month and uh i remember we're coming back and um mckenna on our team she was like you know, we want to do another podcast. Do you have any ideas on who might be good? I was like, you know what? I said, Matt and Nick have been two of the longest running trainers, like almost from like the beginning, beginning. I was like, I'm sure that they could, they could talk on some things. So, and it's, and it's cool to hear you all talk about your program at length, but we, you didn't really talk about the behavioral issue aspect of your folks until we talked about crisis intervention to me. Cause I feel like so many times when you talk to people, they lead with the part about the aggression and behavioral challenges. And then they talk about the other stuff, their backgrounds and all. So it was like refreshing to have this talk. And I would say like 90% of what you all talked about was them as people first. And then they also happen to have these challenges as well. You know, and that's to me, to me, if you if you listen long enough, people will tell you anything or they'll tell you everything. You know, so I feel like it it shows that, you know, the mindset that you'll you'll have and you practice in your programming there. You know, um, and I was just recently 
training another group similar to all who I've trained for years and years. And it's like a class reunion with them, you know, and, uh, they were talking about this short documentary series that just come out that was very specific to certain types of residential programs where there was a lot of rampant abuse and all kinds of things going on. But how sad it is that, you know, there's those types of documentaries and all out there, but no one really ever talks about the good things that happen at places. And is, is, yeah. Uh, and I, we just did a PBS thing out here at Bittersweet. Um, so over the next year or so, if people get a chance, they can watch a viewpoint with Dennis Quaid about Bittersweet Farms. And it's a very positive um, look at Bittersweet Farms. It's just a six, seven minute um, mm -hmm. interlude. That'll be a show between programs on PBS. So throughout the country, if you guys Watch for it, Bittersweet Farms on Viewpoint with Dennis Quaid. So it'll be on there, and it's it's a very positive thing about Bittersweet. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, if you get a chance and it comes out, you know, just shoot me a link through email there, and I'll, I'll check it out. So speaking of links, like how can people – where can people go to look up more information about you all? So we – Bittersweet Farms, we're on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, those kinds of places, but also bittersweetfarms.org is our website um, to go on and check out. It's got all kinds of links to our different programs to look at. Um, it lets you know when our events are happening. If you're here locally in the Ohio area, we have our concerts every Friday. Those It's listed who the musicians are going to be coming up on there. Um, and then, you know, applications for services, those kinds of things are on there. Um, we do tours regularly here at the farm, so... Um, yeah, definitely go on bittersweetfarms.org and check yeah. it out. Um, and, and again, yeah. watch this on PBS. Yeah. Check out Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, our development marketing team is amazing. Um, they're posting things every day. Um, highlights of what's going on in our day program, transition program, Lima program, um, as well as our residential program. So it's really good to some good stuff to see and, um, put a smile on your face for sure. All right. Well, guys, thank you all for spending time with us. Thank you all for watching and listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thank Thanks, you, Chris. Chris. Appreciate it.